Coming up. Now let's talk for a moment about the reaction from the left. I'm not talking about the hypocritical politicians on the left and the hypocritical journalists on the left and the hypocritical commentators on the left who sat silently while Barack Obama ordered thousands of airstrikes in Iraq and Syria without congressional approval, yet now contend that President Trump didn't have the right to order an individual strike on a military leader who our intelligence indicated was involved in the planning and direction of attacks on U.S. targets and involved in planning additional imminent attacks also on U.S. targets. Welcome back to Political Spirits. I'm your host, Franklin Rye. We still stand for the proposition that the left and the right should have a few drinks and talk. Compromise is not a requirement. If those discussions result in us changing or even abandoning our positions, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine too. We just need to talk to each other. In that way, we can unify through speech. And if the discussion becomes a bit heated... At the end of the night, we should still be able to split up the bar tab and be on our way. So what are we going to talk about this week? Well, the obvious thing to discuss is the U.S. drone attack, which took out the Iranian Quds Force commander, Major General Qassam Soleimani. As anyone who's listened to this podcast could tell you, I'm a strong supporter of President Trump. That doesn't mean, however, that I automatically jump to support his decisions. This one, the authorization of the drone strike on Soleimani when he was on a roadway at the Baghdad airport, was clearly a difficult one. There are all sorts of angles to take in evaluating it. There are all sorts of questions that can be asked. Secretary of State Pompeo explained that Soleimani was planning a major attack on Americans in the region. President Trump explained that he was not seeking regime change. But he said, quote, Under my leadership, America's policy is unambiguous. To terrorists who harm or intend to harm any American, we'll find you, we will eliminate you. I'm surprised I haven't heard any commentators from the left, especially those in Hollywood, criticizing the statement because it's reminiscent of Liam Neeson's line in Taken, that I will find you and I will kill you, said after referencing his very particular set of skills. Surely there's a meme out there putting Trump in that scene. There was a time that I'll admit I was too eager for the United States to pursue military action. I grew up in a military family, and I've always supported having a strong military. And Ronald Reagan represented for me the closest thing we had to a perfect president in my lifetime. Incidentally, it's too early to say where President Trump will rank. And my admitted prior over-enthusiasm for military action had a lot to do with the 9-11 attacks. I certainly can never forget them, and my vivid memories of them will always conflict with those of American youth who have no memory of them because they were babies when they occurred or they weren't even born yet. But notwithstanding those memories, I'm tired of wars. I'm especially tired of wars in the Middle East. I'm not looking for a war with Iran. America needs to focus on continuing to grow its economy and on stopping illegal immigration. We don't need another Mideast war. But having said that, I'm under no illusions that Iran will control itself if we sit idly by. As has been correctly noted by multiple commentators, particularly retired military commentators, Iran has essentially been at war with us for 40 years. We just haven't been warring back. We take it and take it, and then they go too far and we respond. Sometimes they respond by backing off. Sometimes they respond by engaging in less direct attacks. What they've never done is respond by engaging in an actual full-on war with the U.S. When we have backed off, Iran has continued to push. Moreover, we can't back off on the economic sanctions. The Iranian regime has been weakened. We have not made regime change our goal in Iran. President Trump has made it clear that we're not seeking regime change, and I'm encouraged by the fact that he's made that clear. But not seeking regime change does not mean that we will not respond to attacks. Most recently, the militia, which Soleimani's Quds Force was supporting, 
attacked a U.S. military base in Iraq, injuring U.S. soldiers and killing a contractor. The U.S. responded with airstrikes on the militia's facilities, and the response to that was an attack by the militia on the U.S. embassy in Iraq. It was in danger of being overrun. The U.S. Marine Station there fought back, and President Trump deployed 100 more Marines to the site, who he then supplemented with an additional 650 troops. The situation could easily have turned into a replay of the taking of the American embassy in Tehran in 1979 with the resultant hostage crisis. It could have easily turned into a replication of Benghazi with the killing of Americans, including the American ambassador. But it didn't, and President Trump's prompt dispatch of reinforcements is the reason. There is no way that Iran isn't still in the process of feeling out, of evaluating Donald Trump. There is no way they could know what we would do. The president's decision sends a message. The message is that if pushed too far, he will respond more severely than his predecessors. And the responses which Iran may have considered to be out of bounds for an American president might not be out of bounds for President Donald Trump. Many seem to believe that Iran will respond in a way which escalates the level of hostilities. I won't pretend that I know what Iran will do. Nor, incidentally, do I believe that the analysts who appear on cable news know what Iran will do. But I submit that a better argument can be made that Iran will restrain itself in its response and the militia's response to President Trump. They may make announcements regarding their nuclear program, which may be no more than what they were going to announce anyways, but which they will describe as being something more, and there are indications as of January 5 that is exactly what they're doing. The bottom line is that I'm skeptical of the opinions of those who claim that the killing of the Quds Force commander will launch Iran and the United States into an active war. We shall see. Next topic. So you believe in something even if it means sacrificing all semblance of logic. Now let's talk for a moment about the reaction from the left. I'm not talking about the hypocritical politicians on the left and the hypocritical journalists on the left and the hypocritical commentators on the left who sat silently while Barack Obama ordered thousands of airstrikes in Iraq and Syria without congressional approval, yet now contend that President Trump didn't have the right to order an individual strike on a military leader who our intelligence indicated was involved in the planning and direction of attacks on U.S. targets and involved in planning additional imminent attacks on U.S. targets. Their hypocrisy is obvious. They say whatever they want to say based on who's in office and have never in the past and almost certainly never in the future will give this president the benefit of the doubt. Instead, I'm going to talk about a particular public figure's comments in the aftermath of the drone strike on Soleimani, and that public figure is Colin Kaepernick. After the drone strike killing Soleimani, Kaepernick put out a tweet that said, quote, There's nothing new about American terrorist attacks against black and brown people for the expansion of American imperialism, close quote. And then he followed that with, quote, America has always sanctioned and besieged black and brown bodies both at home and abroad. American militarism is the weapon wielded by American imperialism to enforce its policing and plundering of the non-white world. Close quote. So let me get this straight. According to Colin Kaepernick, a president issuing an order approving a drone strike on a terrorist who killed or directed the killing of hundreds of Americans and at a minimum hundreds of Iranian protesters, and untold numbers of Syrians opposed to the government of Bashar al-Assad, makes the strike a terrorist attack by America against a black or brown person? What on earth is he talking about? He seems to actually be suggesting that the reason President Trump authorized the drone strike on the commander of the Quds Force was based on the color of his skin and he was disgustingly referring to that attack by U.S. troops using a drone 
as terrorism. Now, one obvious question is why on earth does the media keep publicizing what this guy has to say? Besides nothing to back up his contention, and frankly, there's nothing in his experience that gives him a particular knowledge about this issue at all, he's reported on merely because he's a public figure and he said something controversial. I know it's a 24-7 news cycle, but for God's sake, even what Kim Kardashian has to say is likely to be more insightful than Colin Kaepernick's comment. Does Kaepernick believe that if Soleimani were Caucasian, Trump wouldn't have ordered the strike? More importantly, did anybody ask Kaepernick that question? Certainly a nearly endless string of persons on Twitter pointed out the ridiculousness of Kaepernick's claims, but if the news media is going to publicize those claims, why have they refused to push him to explain them and try to defend them? We know the answer, because those claims come from the left. In this case, the far left, they don't have to be defended. The bulk of the media gives leftist claims and those who espouse them a free ride. And what about Nike? Kaepernick has made quite a living out of being a spokesperson for Nike, and he's been able to do it without putting his body at risk in the NFL. It makes you wonder whether a sensible person would even want to be offered a contract by the NFL when you could make millions just being a public figure. But if a public figure on the right was a spokesperson for a major company, and that public figure made controversial statements from a right-wing perspective, what do you think the likelihood is that the media wouldn't ask that company for its position on those statements and whether it agreed with them? I think we all know that there's no chance the media would let it slide. They'd be asking the company those questions within 24 hours at most. Only companies with spokespersons who don't make right-wing statements are allowed to slide. Maybe we should refer to it as leftist privilege. Next topic. Beware the rights of nature effort. The longer I live, the more I encounter ideas that might not strike me as a threat or likely to be implemented at the, at the time I first hear of them, but then I later find that they've grown and, be, and have become much more threatening. Examples include the initial proposals of politically correct speech codes and restrictions on college campuses, the rise of obsessive focus on the feelings of individuals to the point that they trump facts, downgrading of written history and emphasis on spoken history, which helped lead to the disturbing concept of your truth, and advancement of the argument that minorities cannot be racist because they're not empowered. All those ideas are ones which I heard for the first time many years ago, and I didn't consider them a real threat because I thought they were so absurd that they wouldn't be taken seriously. It turned out I was wrong. Not about them being inserted. They are, in fact, ridiculous ideas which conflict with our free speech rights, the powers of logic which set humans apart from other creatures, common sense, and equal protection of the laws. I was wrong that they wouldn't be taken seriously. Each of those concepts has taken hold significantly in our society, and we see the adverse results of that fact every day. So given my experience... When I heard a new ridiculous idea while listening to the BBC in my car last week, I decided to take it seriously. So what was this new ridiculous idea? It's the idea of granting legal recognition to the so-called rights of nature. You're probably thinking, what? The ridiculous idea is that nature has legal rights, and those rights should be recognized. Well, how exactly would that work? Well, let me give you an example. Let's say that a government entity decides to make changes to a regulation which covers construction of pipelines, or to expand or expedite granting of oil leases on federal property, or to rescind restrictions on fracking. So what would happen under this scenario where the legal rights of nature would be recognized? Well, you might even have counsel appointed to protect nature, and that council might argue that nature would be harmed if any of those legislative or regulatory changes took effect. 
Under the scenario envisioned by the rights of nature approach, you could have a statute or regulation overturned because of a violation of the rights of nature. Think about that. Think about what an offense that represents to government of, for, and by the people. The Constitution sets forth the powers of the federal government, and what isn't granted to the federal government is reserved to the states or to the people. It doesn't grant anything to nature. So what is this really? It's an attempt to get around democracy, or in our case, a constitutional republic. It's an attempt to get around the fact that notwithstanding the buy-in of academia, the left wing, the tech giants, much of corporate America, Hollywood, most of the news media, and the political left, voters aren't buying in to much of what environmentalists are peddling, at least not to the extent the environmental left wants. Most obviously, Donald Trump's actions in rescinding most of the major environmental restrictions, which Barack Obama chose to establish by executive order or other lesser standard, because Obama couldn't get the legislation passed, has enraged the environmental left. And they know, even if they won't publicly admit it, that Trump is likely to be reelected. So what is an environmental leftist to do if the voters don't agree with him? Well, how about trying to get a standard adopted where the earth, nature, gets a say, rather than just the voters? If you think that's ridiculous, I promise you you're not alone. I think so as well. But don't ignore it. Don't refuse to take the effort seriously. Be on the lookout for it and attack it and criticize it every chance you get to everyone you know. Don't let it gain a foothold. Can we rely on the media to ask the questions and publicize the problems with such a proposal? No, especially not if it's the BBC. I listened to their discussion of the subject and kept waiting and waiting and waiting for some suggestion that what was being proposed conflicted with the, with the idea of government of, for, and by the people, that it conflicted with the will of the voters. I never heard the subject brought up. I never heard the question asked. Do I think that was deliberate, a conscious attempt to cover up the issue? I'm not sure. It's at least as likely that the reporters for the BBC live in such a leftist bubble that it never even occurred to them. They might actually think of environmental restrictions as so non-controversial and obviously appropriate that they could never conflict with the will of the voters. Is that shallow and ignorant and poor journalism? Yeah. Are you surprised? I'm not. Think about how this proposal fits in with the other things you've been hearing about for the last couple of years. How about objections to the Electoral College? That's the constitutional formula under which we operate. That can be changed by amendment, but the Democrats know they don't have enough support to get a constitutional amendment. So what happens? An interstate compact is pursued to try to get enough states to agree to follow the popular vote rather than the Electoral College result. They can't get the results they want by following the rules, the Constitution, the actual contract under which the United States of America operates, but that doesn't stop them. Look at the way the House of Representatives abandoned the procedural norms for impeachment so that President Trump was left without legal representation in the impeachment inquiry and without the ability to call witnesses. The norms didn't get them the political result they wanted, so they abandoned them. Look at the fact that the Paris Climate Accords were never submitted as a treaty to the Senate. They never would have been approved by the Senate. Everybody knew that. What should have happened? They should have been submitted to the Senate as a treaty, and when they were rejected, we would have had the word of the people under our system of government. But that didn't get them the political results they wanted. And then, when President Trump was able to rescind U.S. approval of them because they were never approved as a treaty, the left went ballistic. But that's the result they should have expected all along. They just didn't expect that the people would elect Donald Trump. I wish I could say that the BBC segment I heard last week on the rights of nature will be the last any of us hears of that. But I don't think so. I don't believe the environmental left is going to get what they want in terms of environmental regulations. For example, I don't believe fracking is going to be banned, 
at least not at the national level in America. I don't believe that the internal combustion engine is going to be banned. I don't believe that coal is going to be banned. I don't believe in my lifetime or even my children's lifetime that wind and solar are going to become the predominant form of power generation in America. I do believe what will happen will be determined largely by the markets. If oil and gas becomes more expensive because the supply lessens and the remaining oil and gas is sufficiently more expensive to extract that wind and solar, including their associated electric infrastructure, become cost competitive without major government subsidies, then wind and solar will grow significantly. But that's not going to be fast enough for the environmental left. So be on the lookout for these rights of nature proposals and fight them at every turn. Government of, for, and by the people is precious, and we can't give it up, no matter what. No matter how much the left complains that the world is coming to an end, government of, for, and by the people must prevail. And rest assured that the Political Spirits podcast, for the listener, will prevail each and every week, coming once again next week. In the interim, be sure to tell your friends about Political Spirits and like the podcast on Facebook at Political Spirits. And follow me and the podcast on Twitter at Franklin Rye. And remember, all episodes are now on YouTube as well, and the YouTube channel is named Political Spirits Network. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. This is Franklin Rye. Thank you for listening. Thank <laughs> you.